we're actually with our three panelists. Let me introduce you everybody. So first is Dan Meade from Apollo Global Management in New York City. Dan has been with, with Apollo since 2012 as a principal of the firm. Prior to joining Apollo, he worked with another very well-known firm in, in New York, Color Capital, a very large global private equity firm. The Apollo guideline and background, one of the larger global firms involved with alternative products. They have 164, 65 billion in, in assets with three primary types. Uh, private equity, which we'll really spend a lot of time on today, private real estate, and then in a the broad sense of credit market. I think Dan will address some of the distress side, which is more optimistic in our, our discussion. Here we have Derek Emery. So here's a local firm, who most of you probably do know, Greenspring Associates. And he's a new member of the Greenspring team. Just came over in 2014 and is a partner in the firm. Which is a great way to start out. And for those of you who don't know Greenspring, they started back in 2000 and predominantly focused on the venture capital markets and have developed a series of investment products over their, their tenure, starting out with a primary venture funds. And those have been very successful. And they took advantage of co-investments dealing with the contacts around the industry. Good morning. Then the third product we are going to bring is in the secondary market. Which we'll cover all three of these product types when we get into our, into our commentary. And finally, last but not least, I guess, Kevin. Kevin Campbell. From, and by the way, Kevin started his career, the second part of his early career, at Greenspring, one of the original three gentlemen who put together the firm. In fact, I think it was Montague Newhall, <coughs> and the name evolved that. What year has that changed up? From that out of my notes. 2009? Yeah. Kevin joined DuPont Capital Management in 2010, and last year was promoted to the managing director of the private markets group, which basically is investments in the private equity venture capital. I think you all know who DuPont is, and a big part of this story is in 1975, DuPont formed this wholly owned subsidiary, DuPont Capital Management, to assist in the management of their, their pension plan. Today that pension plan is 15 billion in assets, and 2 billion of 15 are invested in private equity venture capital. In fact, DuPont started on the illiquid path back in 1989, so a lot of years of history. And the DuPont uh, Capital Management in 19, get my dates right for you, 1999, before you joined, was given the authority to create investment products for the public market, not just manage pension dollars. <coughs> and since then, you've grown to about two million in assets. And again, fund offerings that uh, are available to limited partners around the country have been very successful. And what I find interesting, they run parallel. So if we're going to invest in a private partnership in venture capital, the pension plan's investing, as are the investors in DuPont Capital Management. So a bigger check for the pension plan. And so he does, again, big theme in this whole area is access. And the DuPont name certainly doesn't hurt to open some doors. So what we want to accomplish this morning is to <coughs> look at a couple key themes. First, we'll start out with a discussion on why are institutional investors interested and invested in private equity venture capital. We'll take a little bit of time on some of the types of products. We'll backdrop on when you're building out a private equity venture capital portfolio. There's numerous product types that you can, you can access. We certainly want to talk about what is happening in the market, current environment opportunities. And again, if we'll leave our questions to the end. We can get through all the, the plan material and uh, have an open, open discussion. So to start things off, please start with a chart and talk a little bit about institutional investors. The most proactive component of institutional investors is the endowment foundation. We also find quite a bit of activity with the defined benefit plans. The high net worth families will be another opportunity. But the endowment foundations have really been the, the leaders in this industry. And this is a chart that is summarizing the broadest annual survey of what the endowment foundation market is doing and how they allocate and 
and sponsored by the National Association of College University Business Officers. And you can see down at the bottom, it's uh, 832 institutions, assets well in excess of $150 billion. So the most comprehensive. And I'm going to pick the middle of the pack. So here's uh, assets, 100 to 500 million, real the mid midpoint. As you come down to alternatives, you're going to see the allocation. This is the average allocation for the universe, 33%. And that is across the board from hedge funds, private equity, venture capital. About half would be in the illiquid side of venture capital. Private equity, point, point. The balance is in hedge funds. And this is also very helpful to look at. This is the asset allocation question. Whoops. Big thumb there. But alternatives on the private side don't tend to move in lockstep with the public markets just because of their structure. They're not valued daily, but mark the market. So they do function differently, particularly in down markets. We'll take a few minutes on that. So this concept of my comments are looking for that premium over public markets. And this is a summary chart from Cambridge. And you can see we have timelines from 25 years to the last five years. This is ending on March 31st of this year. And looking at returns in all private equity, which is all the various ways to invest, against the broad public index, the Russell 3000. So if you go out for the last 25 years, you can see that 3.6% return premium if you've been in the private equity world. The last five years, a bit more challenging, but we had the public markets with very strong returns. You can see the Aiden Russell was up 14% the last five years on the average, way above historical, 7 or 8%. So it's certainly a challenging environment. Sitting here today in 2015, where the equity markets have gotten very scary again, we're seeing more and more interest in the private equity venture capital. Those endowments, those DD plans are asking, doesn't look like we're going to make 8, 9% of our public equities, where do we go to meet that spending? So a lot more interest, which I'm sure you're all seeing that. One more slide or two more, then we'll turn it over to our esteemed gentleman here. But this concept of not moving in, in sync with the public markets, very simple chart. That's me. Here we're looking at the S&P in nine years. You can see uh, 2000 was off 9%. But then what did private equity do during those timelines? See, it's all been a positive return. And later in cycles, that'll readjust. But we hit a quarter like we just had, where the S&P's off 6%. These assets are marked to market. It's more predicated on events that happen. So this does provide some risk management in a total portfolio context. I mean, the public markets are going down. Your liquids tend to be more stable. And then the final, looking at dispersion, Another reason why <coughs> private equity venture capital, from left to right at the top, 10 year chart for periods ending on December 31st of 14. You look at large cap and the dispersion between managers in the top quartile and bottom quartile, 1.4%. A lot of this also plays into active versus passive. Um, what's the added value of active management in the large cap space? Of, uh, dialogue and Core satellite implementation going on. On the private equity side, this is really the importance to access the talent. Look at this version from bottom quartile to top, 9%. So, certainly, if you can get it right and hire the right firms, like the three we have here today, the opportunity for those type of returns that we'll call illiquidity premium that we're all looking for is a very high probability. So, let me turn it over to our panelists. Maybe, Dan, you can start first. Your clients have probably covered the bulk of the motivation, but we just see in the marketplace long term and more recently on um, interest in, in your products and what Apollo is doing. Absolutely, and Al, thanks again for inviting us to participate today. Uh, in terms of the, the current environment, uh, obviously there's a lot of concerns on valuations today, particularly within private equity. The, the biggest area that, uh, of concern that we see is uh, the amount of capital chasing deals. Uh, as everyone's probably seen, a lot of money's been raised. Um, and we also uh, are very pointed to try to move uh, and capitalize on fear when it comes into the market. So a, a great example I can give you is during the crisis.
crisis. Uh, we probably deployed six billion dollars between uh, Bear and Lehman uh, going under. That's probably more than the rest of the private equity industry combined uh, at the time. And today we're most focused on areas um, of dislocation that are causing a lot of investors to, uh, to hit the brakes, but the dislocation of natural resources as well as the deleveraging in Europe. So uh, our performance has really uh, been maintained through the downturn and uh, also the lack of correlation. Uh, obviously, it's, it's hard to outperform significantly when the public equity markets have ripped the way that they have, uh, but uh, private equity still generally is held in, and um, also you can see it most clearly demonstrated on the slide of what happened in the downturn. We're now seeing a move uh, that this happened over the last several years of companies being at multiple billions of dollars before they go public. And so it's harder to access the same growth dynamic in the public market. So in addition to absolute return, which is certainly a primary criteria, and diversification, um, there are many that are turning to this asset class or participation in this asset class to get um, access to the public. Our investors come like like other folks interested in private equity, right? I think there's the big driver is returns, right? They're they're interested in getting a return that provides a premium over you know traditional equities or fixed income, and so that's that's clearly number one. And there's a big gap between number one and number two, but I think number two would be diversification. I think you know without the returns, people wouldn't be so interested in the diversification. Yeah. Um, and so I, I certainly think that's a play, and then to echo what these guys have said, I think the, the private equity markets across the board have been have been active, right? And, and so they've been active from a perspective of dollars raised, dollars invested, but also also in terms of exits, right? IPOs and, and M and A events, and so challenges and opportunities. Great. The next topic we want to touch upon is the playing field. So a simple chart, we're looking at within broad context of private equity venture capital, there are various sub-styles of partnerships that are available to investors. So if you're building a long-term oriented, illiquid part of your portfolio, you want to be diversified by product type. And then on this left side, you can't see the most I can obviously in the buyout space, you have a large side, special situations, get a bit stressed. How about you take that and Derek, on the right side is venture capital sector is co-investments, which you uh, and Kevin Olivia, you're the, you the backup. Yeah. We need you, we're calling it. Perfect. Sure. So uh, when it comes to, to private equity and Apollo, um, we, uh, as, as everyone probably knows, the definition of private equity has, has evolved significantly over time. Uh, in its essence, it was uh, a traditional leverage, leverage buyouts uh, using using lever leverage to buy private companies um, and then uh, using the company's cash flow to, to pay off the <coughs> payments. Um, Apollo is a little bit unique in the way that we approach the private equity spa space. We actually do buyouts, uh, what we call corporate carve-outs, and distress for control within our flagship fund. Uh, most of our peers have uh, one, one focus within there, and, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, on the buyout side, we are very concerned given our value uh, orientation about getting involved in uh, overly competitive um, uh, and significantly crowded deals where you have uh, sort of a standard company company wants to get purchased, investment bank sends up the prospectus, um, uh, price starts to get over eight, nine times EBITDA. Um, we're just fundamental believers that really you know, private equity is a business that works best between six and seven times EBITDA. Uh, beyond that, uh, you need a lot to go right for your for your deal to work, and you also increase your risk of getting whipsawed uh, on the back end. Um, corporate carve-outs, uh, which isn't something that you would really uh, pull out on a slide like this, but it's essentially pulling an existing business out of a parent company. Uh, we did it recently in France, where a conglomerate uh, called Saint Gobain was looking to spin out its glass packaging business, and it's a space that we like a lot uh, because it enters in a lot of non-economic factors when you. Uh, uh, when you look at those deals, typically when a parent decides to get rid of a subsidiary, the, the priority is to get the deal done, uh, not to squeeze out every last dollar from the process. So we saw that with this business that they literally tried to spin out since 2008 when they deemed it non-core. Uh, we pulled the upstream oil and gas assets out of Pioneer in uh, the north slope of Alaska. Um, they were so desperate to get out that they uh, actually wait. They actually uh, did not wait for the wells that were being drilled to be completed at the time, which cut our purchase price in half when, when production came in higher. Uh, distress for control is an interesting space. Uh, I, I'd say a handful of firms really are involved there. Um, us, Oak Tree, the Aries, um, it's uh, somewhat <coughs> unique to see a, a buyout firm of our size involved in that space. And it's it's uh, kind of a very simple reason why we why we do it. We, we feel that the way cycles move move um, today's overpriced buyout market can turn into tomorrow's distress for control opportunity pretty quickly uh, as some deals get done that, that really 
shouldn't have been so. Distress for control, in its essence, is uh, attempting to get control in a company rather than buying the equity outright, figuring out a control position in the cap stack, and then uh, uh, in the reorganization, um, taking control of the company. So it's it's kind of counterintuitive to the way most of private equity works. Uh, you're essentially making a bet on the way down rather than the way up. And um, it, it's an art as much as a science, but we like it because uh, if you're right, you get control of the company and you get a nice private equity style return. If you're wrong, typically it's because something went better than you expected. The company buys back your debt at par and, and you get to reinvest that capital. Um, so really that's that's uh, our approach, which again is, is a little bit different than you would see from a lot of our large, uh, our large peers. Right. Eric? Yeah, <clears throat> so I'll take the right side. Um, starting with venture capital and, and growth equity, they're, they're, they blur a little bit, but I'll, I'll try to distinguish them. So um, both are financing the innovation economy. So uh, think historically the Microsofts, the Oracles, more recently the Googles, the Salesforce.com, the Apples, um, you know, fundamental technology and innovation from the earliest stages and, and getting those companies both off the ground and through those earliest stages of life. and and more recently, even carrying them on further before taking them public. Um, the growth equity tends to be a bit later stage than, than the, vent, the pure venture capital. We've seen a phenomenon of, you know, by virtue of open source code, um, the cloud computing, it's cheaper and easier to start companies and, and grow them. So we're seeing more founder-backed companies that don't have early institutional backing and more often than not, the growth equity are coming in when a company is at a bit more mature stage but hasn't had the institutional backing historically. Um, but it, as I said, it, it can blur a little bit between later stage venture capital and growth equity. The, the secondary investing is um, where you're purchasing shares from either founders or early stage investors in a still private company. So the, the proceeds are not going to the company itself, they're going to other shareholders. And um, as I said, companies are going public much, much later than they used to. And so within that life cycle, you're seeing demands for liquidity from early uh, uh, employees, maybe retiring employees or early uh, investors for some liquidity in that period. And, and you can often get that in a discount to the primary rounds given the, the illiquidity in the market. We do all of these activities uh, in an integrated platform um, and we find that, that being involved in all these various uh, aspects of, of the innovation market um, feed upon each other. Information is critical within these um, illiquid markets and, and so having the information from being active in these very, various aspects uh, is very helpful. I think one of the interesting components, those two guys are fund to funds predominantly, standalone. When it comes to the co investment secondary, they take a minute. What's the advantages of being in the fund to funds to all the general partners you do with around the country? How do you use those contacts to facilitate secondary co investments? Maybe Ken will give a chance to jump in on that first. Uh, you know, whether you're doing that on the leverage buyout side or you're doing that on the venture capital side, an ability to develop relationships with general partners who run some of the premier, you know, private equity partnerships or venture capital partnerships to be able to learn how they source investments, how they look at deals, evaluate deals, and then most importantly, how they add value to a company by helping that company either become more efficient, grow, and, and push towards a path of liquidity are all important factors and, and you know, to the point of co-investments, it's a pretty interesting opportunity to, uh, to to take a look at individual companies alongside that general partner with the attempt to, to make an investment. And again, these are these are opportunities that would not exist if we didn't have the relationship with the, with the general partner and access to the information. And we'll talk about how you know the benefits to the to, to making direct investments or co-investments in companies, but certainly it's a, a pretty nice way to to receive a, a, even a premium on a private equity return. So Derek, you all do a lot of work on the GP world, and you maybe can expand upon having solid comments on how that facilitates creating an opportunity for your investors. Yeah, but we were built 15 years ago with an integrated approach Kevin was part of. Um, you know, 
fund investing, direct investing, secondary investing with this idea that that, that information is a key advantage. So today we have over um, 5,000 companies that we track with it that are, that are venture backed and that we have information on. And that feeds both our direct investing activity, it's the pool from which we draw with knowledge and insight uh, for our, our proactive sourcing of direct investment. It also feeds very much into the secondary uh, because the, the hardest thing is how do you in real time price these either portfolios or for uh, individual company opportunities as they come up. And so having that um, real time information in, in that sort of an accessible database that's proprietary, um, it's, it's, it's not generally available, is a, a really critical differentiator and advantage. Any closing thoughts? I think just on the co invest side, um, from the direct perspective, perspective of the direct uh, investment, um, we have this conversation a lot, especially with large pensions that want to get direct access to our deals. Uh, it's something that you know, we provide uh, pretty much across the board, and it is a great way to blend down fees. It is a great way to uh, participate alongside um, the GP in, in, um, uh, in some of our larger deals, and it's something that is becoming increasingly important to investors, and we're seeing it. We haven't really touched on the special situation side that much, um, but uh, it broadly defined um, special situations, I'd say, is uh, more of the asset class that's grown up since the crisis, um, primarily the illiquid credit side. So uh, areas, it started in, for example, non-agency or MBS. It's morphed into European NPLs area like that. So we're seeing co-invests are evolving beyond the traditional investment of private equity GP A is investing in company B and you get to go alongside that with no fee to things like lightning accounts with state pension plans where you're seeing a dislocation in the credit market. Maybe it has a three year, five year workout, more of a 15% IRR. And we have uh, these baskets that will trade on behalf of our clients for them. And we'll be doing it alongside one of our commingled funds. Um, you're seeing a lot of that now in the high yield market where the contagion from the natural resources space is spreading into <coughs> other uh, sectors. And you're seeing massive gaps opening up in some credits. And for investors that will give us the discretion and, and, and have the uh, flexibility to move that quickly, um, it, it's a great way to uh, to be a provider of capital when, when it's sorely needed. So I think just like private equity generally, the definition of co-invest is, uh, is evolving as well alongside the industry. You know, Al, just one thing I'd like to add on this, this slide, I think it's a good time to, to add it, is you know, the question that we, the three of us, probably get on a regular basis is, and I get asked this question a lot, is, is now a good time to invest in private equity? And, and the reason why I bring that up now is I think this is a good illustration of just how broad the term private equity is. Yes. And so, <laughs> unless somebody's selling something, the answer to that should always be it depends. Uh, because uh, what may be really interesting right now in early stage uh, information technology focused venture capital Maybe that's an interesting opportunity at a given time, but uh, leveraged buyouts uh, are completely uninteresting. Uh, or even within venture capital, maybe healthcare is interesting and technology is not. And maybe growth equity is interesting and early stage is not, or vice versa. So it's certainly there are intricacies to it, and I think you see a lot of media attention spent and, and time spent on with a very broad brush of painting private equity as a whole. It's just there are intricacies that are very, very different and oftentimes not connected. So well, the only thing, if I can add on that, is uh, I, I think that's, that's very true. And I think we'll get to, I think there's a place here we're going to talk about the market environment. So yes. We'll get to that. But save something. I'll save something to that. But I, I think after 9.15. After 9.15. <laughs> as, a, as a prelude, though, I will say, the other thing though, that should be noted is there are, there are multi-year deployment yep. cycles to yep. these strategies, yep. you know, often four or five years. So it's it's also uh, not only there are multiple strategies, it's very hard to, to jump forward. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So so it's very hard to, 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 to pick or time in these, and these should be strategies that are being considered over that, that sort of investment. One of the traps I see investors fall into is that when private equity becomes hot, exactly to Kevin's point, people get excited, they'll start to plow money in, and they don't really understand the J-curve and what it means to the cash flows for their organization. And 
lo and behold, a couple of years later, when they're negative on a market market basis, all of a sudden they have to slam the brakes, which really defeats the purpose of being in private equity. You need to be in it for a sufficient period and consistent with one capital, so your dis your distributions from your prior investments will start to pay uh, for your future investments, and that's a very, very crucial part. Um, we're seeing that right now at Apollo on the natural resources side, and I know a lot of these investors personally that were pouring money into dedicated energy funds between $100 and $140 a barrel. Now that energy is at 40, they've all had to slam on the brakes because they're over allocated. And yeah, as much as everyone says they love to uh, buy low and sell high, in my experience, that's not typically what happens. And it's why you need to be careful. I think one of the, if you're talking about opportunistic uh, additions, I, I think Kevin's absolutely right. You want to be really careful with timing. If you're talking about a core uh, allocation to whether it's a fund of funds or a diversified buyout fund, um, you need to pick a manager that, uh, that you have confidence in and stick with them, because exactly to Derek's point, it's a 10-year life. Uh, it might be a great buying environment today, but it could be a horrible disposition environment when it comes. And uh, you, you don't want to be too subject to those, to those swings, um, because it's, uh, uh, again, you, you want to be, by definition, if you're in a 10-year vehicle, you're in for the long haul. Thanks. So this chart is something we've stolen from not one of your firms, but I'm trying to <laughs> disclose who put this together. But it's very helpful, particularly in our world, if we're starting out with a, a client and starting from scratch. So let's get into private equity venture capital. We want them to understand the life cycle that this entails, and that you have to be patient. That the first three or four years, as you can see from this chart, it's all capital calls. So years five, six, and seven, we truly start to see the benefit of the, the program. We have uh, some clients that unfortunately got involved back pre-1999, and when you look at those type of portfolios, in many cases they could be in the third or fourth commitment to the same GPs or new GPs. That green line is distributions, and the cash flow helps support that spending policy. But also, as Dan just alluded to, when you make that new commitment to a general partner, you go back to square one with capital calls, those cash flows fund those commitments, so it's not money coming out of the traditional side like you had in the, the early years. And it really is a patient game. No one knows what's going to happen next year or year after, so you can't try to be a market timer and say, well, I'm only going to commit next year in private equity, then wait for the next five years to see if I want to do it again. Kevin, I might ask you, if we were using this slide initially to tie back into the various ways to invest, how can we mitigate or shorten a green curve not being so steep and flatlining sooner? And as you build a portfolio, these are some of the conscious steps, conscious steps that we take some of the clients. I'm sure you all do with yours when you're looking at that. Uh, a 10-year timeline could be a, a bit intimidating. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, and what I would say is certainly over the last five plus years, there's there's been almost an allergy to the concept of, of the traditional J curve in private equity. And I think you have a lot of institutional investors and consultants that are looking for ways to try to, to, to make that J curve a bit more shallow and, and a bit shorter. And I think really the most popular ways to do it are, are, are three different ways. One is, is secondaries. One is co-investments, and then the other is, is private credit. So, you know, we talked a bit about secondaries, and, and Derek mentioned secondaries from a, a, a direct secondary perspective, but then there's also the very traditional secondary approach, which is uh, institutional investor or family office makes a commitment to a private equity partnership, uh, which is a 10-year partnership. They hold their position in that, in that fund for four years, and then for whatever reason make the determination Maybe it's uh, items that are specific to that institution decide that they no longer want to hold uh, any assets in private equity, don't want to hold that specific position, whatever it may be, and decide to then uh, try to attempt to liquidate their position in, in, in the portfolio. Uh, not the easiest thing to do, unfortunately, not something where they can call their broker and say, sell, and, 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 and they, they, they get out over uh, you know that afternoon or a couple of days. Um, so then they turn to the secondary market you know, the, the whole theory with the secondary market was if you're able to, as a secondary investor, enter into a fund in year four or five and you're able to purchase those assets at a discount to the current fair market value or net asset value, 
well, then it's a pretty nice way to to to, to shorten or make the J curve a bit more shallow, right? You're you're buying below par, and you're also shortening that ten-year time horizon down to five or six years, which is really the, the really traditional way to, to to try to shorten the J curve. I think also you, you look at the second piece, which is which is co-investments or direct investments in, in privately held companies. Again, traditional private equity fund, whether it's venture capital or or private equity, typical uh, term of a fund is, is a 10-year partnership. So if you're making a direct investment in a company, so if, if Derek and his group are looking to make an investment directly in a company, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and take a guess that his time horizon is in a 10-year hole. Right? You're probably looking for, hey, I want a three to five times cash on cash return in a three to five year time period. Right? So if you can get a three times cash on cash return in a three year time period, uh, you know, as the rest of your portfolio is maturing, well, that's a pretty nice way to make that green line a bit more shallow and a bit, a bit shorter. Then the, the other point that I mentioned, and I think, you know, to, to Dan's point, this has become a bit more popular as, as this kind of very funny special situation bucket that, that is, is essentially everything else in private equity, which includes equity and, and credit and so on. But the idea of, of private credit, whether that's uh, 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 wherever you sit the capital stack, whether that's mezzanine or, or even or even senior uh, positions where you're getting a, a pretty nice current yield from day one on your position. And, and while that's not going to generate your entire return, the fact that you have a cash flowing position early on in the, in, the, in the holding is also a pretty nice way if you have a portion of the portfolio dedicated to, to, to private credit to, to have that type of characteristic. Again, it's a way to help shorten and, and make that J curve a bit more shallow. But I would say as, as an investor in private equity, there's no way to completely eliminate the J curve. That, that's, that's just not going to happen or not likely to happen. Um, but certainly there are ways to make it more shallow and, 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 and shorter. We look at the concept of fundraising. What is the environment? A simple analogy, back in 2000, coming off of the technology boom, $100 million was, $100 million was raised in venture capital. It's way above historical norms, which raises the question, too many dollars chasing too few opportunities, pricing gets blown out of proportion. 2009, it dropped down to $10 million, reflect paralysis in 2008. The other metric then is those valuations. We're going out to the market to look at where are things are overpriced, where we find opportunity. And then the third, which is probably in many cases predicated on the first two steps, the exit strategy as general partners, how do you monetize the return for your, your investors? So Dan, we can start with you and, and just walk through that sequence of fundraising valuations and how do we get out and make a profit? Sure. Um, on the fundraising side, I, I think we really characterize this environment as okay, um, maybe somewhat good. Um, I'm personally seeing among groups that have to be invested, state pension plans, corporate pensions, uh, there's a lot of fear, um, exactly as you alluded to, Al. Um, you know, a lot of money's been raised, a lot of money has been raised for very specific opportunities. There's a lot of concern about a uh, crowding effect, and there's um, a, a lot of dynamics are opening up that people never expected to see in the course of their careers. Um, we had a, uh, a dinner with some large Canadian pensions, and uh, you know, a lot of these groups are in the headlines for, for buying GE's direct lending business, uh, large parcels of real estate, and they said, you know, uh, most people have not been in the business long enough to, to think back to you know, 25 years, but no one ever expected to be able to to, uh, to sell real estate for a 3% cap rate in uh, gateway cities, and, and that's exactly what's happening. So um, I think you're seeing uh, very, very selective allocations among those in that category that have to be invested with, with a lot of concern about what's going to happen with interest rates, with the amount of capital that's up there, with as I alluded to before, the private equity market being around 10 times EBITDA. Uh, we think the public debt markets are even further out of whack. They're about two standard devi deviations away uh, from the norm right now. And uh, one thing that we look at, and I know it's a, it's a slide we, we talked about, including Al, um, if you look at triple C issuance in the debt market, um, a spike tends to pretend a distress cycle. Uh, well, we've had a double spike uh, with no distress cycle, arguably. It, it started within the last six months or so uh, with the contagion from the natural resources space, but that's that's an area that we're looking at. So um, on the distress for control side, we're obviously looking at a lot of uh, opportunities there and um, seeing, uh, again, where the lines get blurry, things like being able to buy assets.
benefits out of a, a 363 disposition, uh, which we did in the case of uh, Hostess when we bought um, when we brought Twinkies back uh, to the world. Oh, uh, no, no samples. <laughs> uh, the investor can have <laughs> the, uh, um, Those were actually, that, that business was coming out of a full liquidation, um, so it was technically a buyout, but uh, it, it was essentially a distressed deal. Uh, we're also buying uh, uh, oil and gas assets out of dispositions from bankrupt companies right now. We're not taking the company, we're taking the assets. Um, in terms of valuation, I think we already, we already touched on that. With exits, um, you know, Paulo, we, we always say you know, we, we tend to drive investors and consultants crazy because our answer to every question is it depends. Um, with us, when the IPO market got uh, got hot, uh, we on this uh, now famous for saying we're selling everything that isn't nailed down, and if it is nailed down, we're refinancing it. Um, we tapped the IPO market as much as we could over the last couple of years, and uh, it looked for a long time like we were a couple of years too early, and, and now we're very happy that we did. Um, you know, one of the things in terms of our approach to private equity is we don't, um, uh, uh, what's the old adage, uh, you know, love your spouse, uh, you know, love your, love your home, don't love your deals. Um, if you get, uh, if you have the opportunity to sell, sell, uh, and find a better way to, to redeploy the capital. So, uh, we've done that a lot and, and we're very happy we did, uh, we've been holding dry powder back to, uh, uh, to put more capital to work when dislocation comes and we, uh, we think it's here. But the peak was 2000 when billion was raised at much too much. Um, it troughed at about 10 billion a couple years later. So 2014, the most recent full year, we had we raised 31 billion um, in ventures. So that's about a third of, of the peak. So we're, we're nowhere near those levels, thankfully. Um, and, and we continue at that pace or a little bit higher than that so far this year. Um, I think it, there is a phenomenon in our market, though, and, and I think it feeds into many of the headlines that people are reading. So while there's 50, 31 billion uh, invested into venture, there was 50 billion deployed into venture companies last year. So significantly greater than that. And, and where is that those dollars coming from? We've had um, a lot of these crossover investors, the, the key rows, the fidelities coming into the market, the hedge fund. These are these are non-traditional venture investors, and they're investing in these very, very late stage crossover rounds. Um, that's something that, that we're, we're watching. That is not coming from us, it's not coming from our universe, and in fact, um, many of our companies and our managers are benefiting from that, from having access to that cheap late stage capital. But that is, I think, the portion of the market that, that you want to watch. About 75% of the billion dollar plus of financing into venture back companies have come from non-venture investors. And, and we're starting to see that soften a little bit. Um, it, it, well, first of all, hit the, hit the valuation. So that has pulled up valuations a bit. Um, you know, so Series A uh, valuations, if you look back to 2009, Industry median was about 6.2 million um, last year. That had gone up to about 15 million. So that's a that's a that's a reasonable increase on a percentage basis, but still on an absolute basis, you know, 15 million valuation is a level from which you can make quite a bit of return mm -hmm. if you get the, get the company right. Where you've really seen the explosion is the later stages, the Series D e plus that incorporates some of these. Um, uh, big late stage rounds that have gone from about 49 million in 2009 to 184 million more recently, and, and so that's beyond you know the levels at which we invest or manager invest. We're 75 percent of our manager Series A stage, um, and, and that's where you've seen more of a of a spike. Um, in terms of exit environment, overall, it's still quite healthy. This, this our universe, 75% of the time, is exiting through M&A, um, and that continues to be a, a very active and, and robust market. Within the IPO universe, you have seen uh, a couple of, of these late stage rounds get priced down at, at, at the IPO, so you're, you're starting to see that um, come back to those really late stage investors, and, and that's you know, kind of a healthy phenomenon, but we see that back up into our universe. Um, and, and so we're, we're not totally just pleased to, to see that. 90% uh, of what we're doing is buyouts and special situations opportunities where partnership sizes are a billion dollars in capital or below. And, and really, typically, fund sizes are anywhere between 100 and $750 million. 
and within venture capital, uh, we're really focusing on fund sizes below $400 million in fund size. So uh, very much on the smaller end of the market across the board. So uh, what I would say with regard to fundraising is uh, fundraising valuations and, and, and exits, I, I would say it's, it's been active. Very active is, is the best way to describe it. I would say from a fundraising perspective, <coughs> 2013, 2014, and 2015 have all been incredibly active. I think 2014, I've, I've been in the world of private equity and venture since late 2000. Uh, 2014 was the, was the most busy that, that I've ever seen in terms of just number of managers and, and, and capital being raised. And, and uh, not only are groups raising slightly larger amounts of capital, but they're also doing it in a, in a faster timeline, um, and so certainly that's 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 been an incredibly active, and, and there's there's you know cause for concern because of that 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 fundraising activity. As I mentioned, private equity, and, and I think in everybody's mind is is an idea of a market built on inefficiency, and, and the more capital that you have in the market, the more efficient that might become. And I think that we we've, we've seen that turn out as well in valuations, right? The more capital raised, the, the the, the higher you're going to see your price points. You know, Dan mentioned earlier the, the 10 times uh, trailing 12 months EBITDA at sort of as an average purchase price multiple. We, we too have a value orientation. We like our managers that, that invest in, in buyouts to invest at five to seven times trailing 12 months EBITDA. So 10 times is, is, uh, is, is pretty scary. Um, so what impact has that had on, on different groups that we've invested with? I think they've slowed their investment pace considerably. Uh, instead of doing four investments a year, they're doing two investments a year. Um, I think they're occupying their time with, uh, you know, trying to uh, obviously very quickly deciding which side of the coin they're on, whether they were a buyer or a seller in this market. And a lot of folks are sellers in this market, so they're selling a lot of their existing companies, and that's that's occupying the time that would have would have otherwise been spent, uh, you know, bringing new deals to the finish line. Um, but but certainly the, the the valuations have been have have been uh, pretty interesting and, and you know as a group that's interested in value, this type of environment for us is really what separates people that are true value investors from relative value investors, uh, folks that have slowed their pace and even in this environment are still paying five and six times for things and just really working hard on on sourcing opportunities where they can pay that price. Th those are the folks that are going to be interesting across multiple market cycles. The folks that come in and say, uh, we know last time we talked to you about value, but you know, we paid 10, 11, 12 times for this business, and here's why, and they start justifying or rationalizing uh, why, why they paid higher purchase price multiples. That, that, that becomes an area of concern. When it comes to exits, I'm going to think of anything, the, the, the bailout in this situation, if you will, or the, the upside in this situation, is that for as much capital as we've seen invested, you've also seen a nice set of exits, and to Derek's point, I think, you know, across the board in private equity and venture, majority of the exits continue to be through, through M&A, um, and, uh, and certainly there's, there's been some, some pickup as well, and, and just over the last few years in terms of the number of IPOs with, with regard to, to exits as well, but, but again, the only way that I can categorize all three areas is it's just incredibly active, and, and uh, you know, you, you always get concerned when you hear other limited partners, other institutional investors in, you know, the summer of 2014 or the summer of 2015 when you get together at an annual meeting or you see them at an airport during the annual meeting season and they say, we're already into next year's, you know, next year's budget or next year's allocation. We've already committed all of our 2014 dollars and we're thinking about 2015. That's, that's a scary concept. So uh, for us, it's, it's we've, we've done the same thing that that we've asked our managers to do, which is let's be really careful in the pace. Let's let's pick groups. Uh, it's, it's sort of an environment where you have a flight to quality, where you probably see a lot less. Uh, you see a lot more emerging or new managers that are raising capital, and, and in our portfolio, I think you see a lot less of that. Right? We 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 like folks that are a bit more battle tested in these types of environments, and and, and groups that have proven that they have you know valuation discipline and also an ability to to sell at the right time. We're getting close to our, our tail end, but this is all linked. Looking forward to 2016, based on all these comments, where are you focusing? Can you see the, the opportunities? And again, we'll let you sure. 
Um, sure. So as, as I've alluded to, we're really, as a firm, thematically focused on three broad areas. Um, one is the dislocation and natural resources. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about at Apollo is uh, we think dislo dislocation creates opportunity, and, and Kevin alluded a lot to this in his, uh, in his comments, um, uh, and I, I'm seeing it uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis in terms of the fundraising cycle. It's the, the danger with any sector is to, to chase performance when things get hot and then to slam on the brakes when things come back down again, and, and that's what uh, I think you've seen a lot in the natural resources space, and we're seeing a lot of opportunity to, um, uh, to be buying assets on the cheap here. And, uh, at the end of the day, uh, prices aren't going to go to zero. Um, we think you know, oil probably equalizes between $70 and $75 a barrel. Natural gas is a little bit more, act, uh, more act, uh, of a local market. And then on the metal side, um, uh, you have in, in several sectors, uh, big swaths of the industry are trading below their, uh, are trading at negative cash flows right now, given what pricing is. So uh, really, yeah, the, the, the sort of uh, trite adage is there's no there's no price, there's no cure for low prices like low prices. Uh, production starts to shut down naturally. It takes time, and, and again, that's where the patience that, that Kevin was alluding to comes in. Uh, we think where real uh, real money can be made. Uh, the other theme is uh, the deleveraging in Europe. We still have, by our uh, estimate, over two trillion dollars of non-core assets are stranded on balance sheets for banks, closed-end funds, insurance companies. Uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, again, it falls more into the special situation category, more of a sub 10 year high teens returning asset class, but an opportunity to be senior in the capital structure with cash flow, again, shorting the, cap the J curve like we talked about, and still generating uh, private equity like returns. And then uh, we haven't really talked about it today, but uh, broadly, we think there's a, a major opportunity in investors' need for yield, uh, especially on the pension side, where uh, investors are several hundred basis points below their liability targets. and. Uh, we think a gap has opened up between uh, essentially the daily liquidity market where there's so much capital given quantitative easing, uh, all the returns have been armed out of it, and uh, the illiquid world which can get you the returns that you need, but there's a limited um, appetite for it given everything we've talked about today. So um, we have a, a quarterly liquidity vehicle where we're targeting areas like infrastructure debt, taxable munis, um, select high yield, CLO, um, uh, CLO debt, and uh, it's, it's an area where you can get high single digit returns if you're nimble um, and if you're not beholden to daily liquidity and of track um, uh, credits. So, uh, on the idiosyncratic side, we are seeing opportunities in real estate on the private side in uh, tier two cities, um, getting the opportunity where you can get the same generous financing packages as you can in the tier one cities and get a couple hundred extra basis points of, uh, of yield and um, uh, life settlements on the purely idiosyncratic side. Um, still an area where a lot of those assets are stranded and there's not many buyers. Unlevered companies by and large and, and sort of unlevered within our portfolio um, driven by those those technology trends. And there's some very significant ones out there. Um, you know, cloud computing was in an eight billion dollar market as recently as two thousand nine, seventy eight billion this year, forecasting ninety three billion next year. Uh, big data and the use of uh, applied data in computing was, um, uh, it, you know, just this year, eight zeta bytes, which is 10 to the 21st bytes of, of, of data. But that's supposed to go to 35 zeta bytes by 2020. Um, and mobile, um, you know, the, the 8x forecast growth between smartphone um, data today and, and 2020, and I saw some, just this morning the CDC released that 50% of U.S. houses now have no landline. They're entirely mobile. That's up from 3% in 2010. So, I mean, there, there's some very big fundamental technology trends. It's not all technology. We also do healthcare. So, the mapping of the human genome, what that's exposing. Um, there's some very fundamental um, innovation opportunities here that we're exposing. This so, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, special situations are, are, are pretty interesting at this point. Uh, I'll give a special situations equity example. Um, you, know, you take a, a privately held company, call it a, a family owned business or manufacturing business that's been around for 40 or 50 years. They have a, a really good position in the market. They've got a good brand, good customer base, very strong fundamentals, but there's a, a, a troubled balance sheet. and. Um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of folks, to Dan's earlier point, a lot of folks think about special situations and, and that type of investing in an 08, early 09 type of environment. I, we're not big believers that, that you need to, 
you need to sort of think about it from, from the environment perspective. I think, uh, unfortunately, people create special situations. People make bad decisions uh, in any market, uh, whether that's, you know, uh, expansion into a product line that they shouldn't have gone into, or they dumped a bunch of money into it, into a facility that they should have gone to, bad management decisions. Uh, so I certainly think that there's ample opportunity for private equity firms to come in, and, and especially with the value orientation, and, and be able to to help these businesses, right? Be able to either uh, uh, you know put some cash on the balance sheet and, and, and help them to, to redirect. And that's a pretty interesting opportunity, I think, for for everybody involved. The, the other thing I'd say that oftentimes gets lumped into the special situations bucket is is the idea of the corporate carve out. Like there's there, there are a significant number of opportunities where you've got a, a business unit within a larger public company or a business unit within a larger company that has little to no time or, or resources being paid to, to it and, and the ability for a private equity business to come in and, and carve out that, that piece of the business, uh, put in the right management team, put some dollars behind it and, and some, some thought behind it and try to position it in the market is also a pretty interesting opportunity. But I, you know, I think the, the biggest thing that I would say is that a lot of people, especially, on, on, and I'm, I'm speaking poorly of the institutional investor community as a member, uh, but, but you know, I think a lot of people in, in, in our seats think about you know, special situations when they see you know, massive market corrections and, and downturns. And, and again, I think you know, pe people make bad decisions in, in, in management every day, and they don't necessarily have to wait for the cycle. Now we can turn over to you all. Hopefully you have some questions or Eric, might want to touch banner upon, so open up to David. Thank you. <laughs> Is anybody looking at Asia, Latin America, or, or Africa? Given the fact that we're value investors and we do so much in stress and distress, we really need to understand rule of law, how the markets operate, and so it's, it's tough for us to venture into, uh, into true frontiers. I, I'd be very, very surprised to ever see Apollo in a true frontier market like Eastern Europe or Africa. It's just something where uh, you just get wiped out too easily by stroke of the pen risk. And uh, it, it, there's one funny anecdote where the head of our natural resources group came from uh, Riverstone. And, and for anyone who's invested with them in the past, they have a famous deal called Cobalt uh, that they did in Africa. And they spent uh, over a billion, uh, a million dollars just on legal fees for the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And they still got sued uh, doing that. So it, it's just, you know, with, with our guys, we kind of laughingly say we're happy to do deals abroad as long as it's Canada. Um, you know, just wanted to do it home, and that, that's that's uh, that's restricted to uh, to natural resources. But um, you know, really, Western Europe, North America uh, is really where we're going to stick. And, and again, that's that's not that's not emblematic of the industry. It's more we're, we're much more focused on the downside than I think some of our peers are. Uh, our our feeling is there's plenty of folks if you want to be first through the door. Uh, there's plenty of folks who will make ten times their money. There's plenty